Hello YouTube, how are you doing? Welcome to Illinada. Today we wanted to talk to you about the story that happened in the city that we live in actually. It was in Toronto in 1939 and the story um, I came, came it across a couple of years ago and it caught my attention uh, then. I wasn't thinking of shooting a video about it uh, back then but I remember it was quite striking because of the circumstances and the conditions that were described in it so mm. the story is about a woman she was of a British descent but she was incarcerated for having a cross racial relationship with a Chinese guy she was jailed for being unmanageable or incorrigible which was somewhat a criminal of oh maybe it wasn't a criminal offense there are a lot of technicalities there but there was something that women could go to jail for. The reasons you would be considered incorrigible vary from being drunk in public to having a child out of wedlock mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to living... Idle or dissolute lives. Yeah, idle or dissolute lives to living in a common law partnership and having small children from previous marriage mm -hmm. or relationship in the same household that was considered like setting a bad example and a standard to children. It was very strict and very stern at that time. I would say almost very borderline unacceptable. I mean, they would basically treat them as tools and not as human beings, right? Like they were a means to an end, more or less. Well, that happens these days too, but the standards have shifted over the, the course of a few decades. The things that she described in her book, she actually wrote a book, Incorrigible, that we uh, had to read uh, to prepare for this video. They seem unspeakable, they seem unimaginable. It's something that it's hard to picture being a modern person. Like I was born in 90s. Same year. Yes. Uh, she's <laughs> actually older than I am. Yeah, it was very educational because we also take a lot of things for granted. Obviously, we take for granted all the rights and uh, comforts and conditions that people have fought for. And we have to be grateful, obviously, because it didn't come naturally. Yes, you know, a lot of people had to work in and tirelessly stress themselves out to be able to give us the and comforts we have. Yeah. And it's important to know the history too, so that we don't go back to that. Mm, because, it, yeah, it's, it was terrible. What happened to Velma? We're going to start with how she was born and how she ended up in the situation that she ended up in. Also, we'll try to describe what were the laws at place at that time. She was born in 1920 in Vancouver to a woman of a British descent and a man of a Greek descent. And at that time, Greeks weren't very well regarded they were considered second-class uh, citizens. Velma's father, Alex, his original last name was Dimitrois, and he got anglicized, and that's how he got his Western last name, Demerson. He was very preoccupied with his social status, his reputation. He was very prejudiced and uh, proud and arrogant, even though he clearly had some flaws in his, uh, well, something that at that time was considered flaws and his reputation and in his background. As to Valma's mother, Alison, she was advised not to marry a Greek guy because, quote, she would end up having a black baby. She recalls being extremely proud when first baby that she had was blonde with blue eyes mm -hmm. and she was proud to push the stroller down the street. But Valma, she was a second child and she had dark features. She had dark uh, eye color and mm -hmm. hair, yeah. Mm -hmm. At some point, Valma's family moved to New Brunswick, where her father opened an ice cream parlor and um, Valma's mother was helping there by making candy. Later, her father would open a restaurant and he didn't need Allison's help anymore. Allison would lead a very social life. She was a very outgoing person. She took up dancing and socialized with other folks. That led to some issues in their marriage. Alex got resentful of Allison, but he weren't any better. He got interested in a woman that worked as a waitress in the restaurant. And at some point, Allison's and Alex's marriage shattered. They had to split up and Allison moved to, to Toronto with two kids. Mm, understandably so. Yeah. I mean, if he's uh, banging a waitress out back, then... <laughs> I guess you gotta move, right? 
So she moved to Toronto where she owned a rooming house. She wasn't very selective when it came to uh, finding tenants. So the way Velma described a house was, it was kind of a madhouse in a way that people that stayed in that place were pretty dysfunctional and mm -hmm. they just added to chaos. They, they did get accused of, I guess, harboring a lot of illegal activities as well, mm -hmm. just like drinking, which was prohibited at the time, and also certain other things that were happening mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the area. Allison had some boyfriends, she would get into relationships, even though at that time it was very frowned upon. As Velma was growing up, she would go back and forth between her father's and her mother's households. When she was 16, she moved to New Brunswick and worked at her father's restaurant and a local theater. And at some point she went on a date with a guy and got raped during the date. Although it's not the highlight of the book, like she didn't go back to this experience anywhere. But I feel like based on other biographies, not just Velma's, but a few other biographies that I've read and watched, uh, it was quite a common experience. Many women had to go through it. And unfortunately, they weren't very protected due to many reasons. I mean, it's, it's great that it's better now, you know, due to like, first of all, it's easier to investigate and to prove and then the society is more open and protective this, these days. We are more, mm, we have less tolerance to those things, mm -hmm. you know. And at that time, the reputation was more important. So people would prioritize their reputation. Yeah, th they would try to hide certain things so that they wouldn't hurt not only themselves, but also their family members mm -hmm. or anybody else that was associated with them. Because that could lead to a lot of detrimental things mm -hmm. in their own lives. Like they could lose their jobs. They wouldn't be able to work anywhere else because of the reputation that they have. Mm -hmm. And really, it's not their fault. At the end of the day, it's just something that occurred to them. And then they couldn't really talk about it too much. But I guess it's back in the 1930s and 1940s, there wasn't nearly as much physical evidence and investigative tools to be able to catch people doing certain things so mm -hmm. date rape and things like um, murder or even any other kind of heinous criminal activities sometimes did go unanswered because yeah. they didn't have the tools to find those people right yeah but now in Canada and in most parts of the world um, it's a lot more accepting and people are able to express themselves and feel protected and feel like they're mm -hmm. gonna get help after the rape she didn't tell that to her dad or anyone she didn't report it she i guess got a little distressed nervous she was stressed out a little so she would stay up late and go out and her dad he was irritated by that so he sent her back to toronto to live with her mother and brother when she was 17 she went out to have a dinner with her mom and her mom's friends to one of the chinese restaurants downtown toronto that's when she met a guy that was a waiter there he ended up being her boyfriend he caught her attention and she was trying to get him to notice her and he asked for a date their relationship started to develop pretty rapidly and her mom was supportive of her decision and her mom's friends as well they were more open-minded when they felt safe but as a general rule of thumb it was not acceptable and it was not um a respectable thing to do to mm -hmm. go out with anyone you know to associate with yourself with asian a asians and I chinese in particular it wasn't just something that people did at that time yeah they she used to go to his house too a lot and uh visit just to have what was it tea or was some sort of well they moved in together pretty drink. Yeah, they moved in together pretty fast and then they moved to Hamilton because that's where Harry had to follow the workplaces that he could work. Uh, the Chinese were very restricted as to where they, they could work and what were the ways for them, acceptable ways and lawful ways for them to provide for themselves. So he found a job in Hamilton and they moved with Velma together and he got her pregnant. She didn't tell that to Harry or anyone. But at some point, Allison, well, Allison was supportive, as I said, but Velma's brother, he um, hated the fact that Velma was going out with an Asian guy. 
Velma's brother once asked her mom, why do you let her go out with an oriental? Yeah, no, that was a direct quote from the book. And thankfully, Velma's mother took the high ground and actually told him to mind his own business. But, I mean, she could have just as easily been influenced by Alex and by society and the people around her too, right? To kind of well, be she, against the relationship. Yeah. Even though she was openly accepting to her daughter and showing that she was supportive, you never know, you know. She was uh, of an open-minded uh, nature, more or less. Yes, much much more so than her brother and her father. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, she, she did fortune-telling. I think we mentioned that fortune-telling with tea leaves and teacups. Which I'm kind of curious as to how that even works, but I haven't looked into it, so. Mm. Well, I'm familiar with um, coffee reading. So you basically drink your coffee until you get the um, like the, um, the grains at the bottom. The grains at the bottom, uh -huh. and then you flip like the flip. No, I mean like put put the cup vertically, and see uh, uh, what kind of pattern it's gonna arrange, and try to interpret it in a way that. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. Well, that's in more interesting than just uh, straight drinking Starbucks, I guess. Well, yeah, it's more interesting. I don't know whether or not I would take um, any of it as actual truth, but mm. you know, whatever. I've never done it. Don't knock it till you try it. Somehow, mm. Alex, Velma's father, he found out. So it could be either through Velma's brother or Velma's mother. The reasons could be different why Alison could have told that to her father. It could have been just a carelessness or she could have tried to be annoying because she was very resentful of Velma's father, Alex. I'm pretty sure I did read in the book that she was a little a little tired of Velma disappearing too. But hmm. anyway, um, I guess they lived together at this point. Well, eventually Alex... Velma's father, he found out, right? And then whether he was informed by the brother or by the mother, um, he decided that this was unacceptable and that his daughter could not be in a relationship with a Chinese immigrant because that would hurt his reputation and that would hurt his family's reputation. And he was very reliant on that for his success in business and where he stood in society, especially being a Greek descendant. So he decided that that was unacceptable and he had to go and do something about it. That's when he took a train from St. John, where his restaurant was and where Velma used to live, all the way down to Toronto, to where she lives now with her mother. And he spoke with the police to find out where she lived because he didn't have that information at the time. Harry and her were in Hamilton. And eventually the police were able to locate her. And during one of their breakfasts between Velma and Harry, uh, the police barged in, kicked down the door, and actually her own father mm -hmm. pointed her out and told them to arrest her for being incorrigible or yeah. unmanageable. From what I could read in the book, it was clear that Velma was pretty clueless about what was happening to her and what she would have to go through and what to expect. So she was just taken. Did she have to spend like a few days in a car or something like that before what? before the court? Because like the court didn't happen the same day, right? No, I guess she was probably detained at the local police office. Yeah, so she uh, she was detained in a local police office. And then she had, like, the, there was a court date where she was um, deemed as uh, incorrigible. The judge decided that she breached a female refuge act. So she, she got incarcerated under Section mm -hmm, 15, mm -hmm. but under Section 17 it states that any parent or guardian that deems any female that's under the age of 21 as unmanageable or incorrigible uh, can be brought before a judge and then sent to a reformatory or... Mm -hmm. It was a reformatory, mm -hmm. I believe, for a minimum, or sorry, a maximum of two years. So she could only serve a maximum ser sentence of two years, but she was brought before this judge more or less just for having an interracial or biracial relationship mm -hmm. that her father disagreed with. Mm -hmm. She was brought before judge and she was um, convicted of being incorrigible. It's a very vague term there are many things that fall under the term incorrigible and well e even women up to the age of 35 could be tried under this section 15 under the female refuge act and on all the different things that would fall under being considered incorrigible were were pretty minute in today's standards mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. for example being caught in public drinking mm -hmm. or having a child out of wedlock or being in a relationship with mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. uh interracial person, somebody who wasn't of the same race as you, um, 
something some as small as just living an idle or dissolute life where you just you weren't achieving as much as society thought you should or that your parents thought you should uh, you could be tried under this section 15 or section 17 depending on who was it was also repealed only in uh, 1964 so mm. or 1969 69, 69 yeah yeah which so is not that long ago mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like my mom was born in 1969 so well, there you go yeah <laughs> it's a good year. Mm -hmm. People convicted under this act, well, they weren't supposed to go, well, they didn't break a criminal law. They weren't guilty under criminal act. They weren't supposed to be sent to a jail. Instead, they would be sent to some sort of a correctional facility, you know, with the very soft core uh, rules and conditions. So she was sent to a um, Belmont house, which was originally built for feeble-minded and wayward women. Basically, um, you just stay there and you have some obligations to fulfill during the day. Like you have to wear a uniform and you have to like do the cooking or cleaning or like sewing, things like that. Like, like well, basic, basic home, um, home care you know, activities and chores, things like that, which they considered at the time, I guess, to be beneficial to women specifically because they could use those skills to find jobs mm -hmm. when they mm -hmm. would leave. Mm -hmm. So her detention, even though like it was unfair, it was terribly unfair, it wasn't horrible, right? Like it's not a nightmare. Although like, I don't know, like how I would react. I um, guess, yeah, if, go ahead. I was gonna say, just being held against my will would already yeah. kind of yeah. put well, me off. What I was trying to say, Bellman House like wasn't terrible. Although there were certain things that happened by law enforcers they were pretty unlawful and they made a lot of mistakes uh, when it came to enforcing it too and they used lots of loopholes and manipulations to i mean, I mean just, the, yeah. you know the refuge act itself is kind of flawed in the sense that well one it targets specifically women um and secondly too that the fact that any person not only a family member mm -hmm. or somebody who was directly related to you or had some sort of connection to you but anybody, even just some random person who was walking down the street who saw you engaging in any of these acts could actually bring you forward under these but, female refuge acts. But then, like, what if you have, like, a crazy relative? I mean, it's not going to... It's not making it any better, right? No, no. I mean, at the end of the day, I would hope that the insane asylums or the assistance that was available at the time would be able to help you with that situation. Mm -hmm. But then again, those those are a whole other story on their own, I guess what goes on behind those doors yeah so at some point Bowman house was sold off and it was gonna be um, transformed into a um, senior home and all the girls that stayed there they had to be moved somewhere and they were moved to what turned out to be Andrew Mercer reformatory which was a jail uh, downtown Toronto which is now uh, demolished no one even said anything to them they were just taken placed in a different facility and the conditions were very different they're drastically different mm -hmm. she could tell a difference right off the bat it was essentially considered the first prison for women in toronto i believe mm -hmm. the first the first women specific prison mm -hmm. even though it was classified as a reformatory but it, the the things that went on there and the actions of the people that worked there kind of stayed otherwise so she was placed in a very small cell, 4.5 by 6 feet. It's basically the size of a single bed. Not all beds would fit in such a cell. It was very tight. The um, rules were very stern. She wasn't allowed to talk to anyone except for her free time, which was only 30 minutes a day. She wasn't allowed to lay in bed except for the bedtime. Yeah making her stay even more uncomfortable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You would literally only be able to lay down at the end of the day. So from the time that you woke up till the time that they considered bedtime, you're standing mm -hmm. on your feet. Mm -hmm. And you're either working or you're doing something that mm -hmm. is probably considered labor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they um, had to do the work all day long. Um, mm -hmm. mostly cleaning, baking, sewing, kneading. Funny is that Mercer Reformatory was referred to a correctional facility with home-like atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. That's so <laughs> they tried to sell it off as home-like, yeah, which, yeah. I mean, they made you do labor that was like home, but it didn't feel like being at home. <laughs> yeah, usually you can lay in bed at home and you can talk to people, you know. Yeah, and exactly. 
she said that the girls there they were subject to weekly degrading medical examinations that they first of all they didn't need such frequent invasions in their bodies it was very degrading very painful and she contracted viruses a few times and she believed that she was a subject of medical examinations which we tried to find more information on because it was hard to back it up but maybe mm -hmm. she did have grounds to believe that we don't know but personally i didn't get a strong impression that that was the case it's, it's all speculation right like mm -hmm, at the end of mm -hmm. the day the book is written by velma and it is her thoughts and opinions so mm -hmm. she considers the procedures that she went through and at the time the medical experimentation that was occurring to possibly be connected to what was happening to her and she does have i guess a basis because she was in a mixed race relationship she was going to have a child that was of mixed race between greek and Chinese and these doctors would have deemed that as undesirable something that wasn't to their standards so they mm -hmm. could have maybe tried to do something but again it's all speculation and she did write a fiction book called mm -hmm. Nazis in Canada which probably goes deeper into that I well I wish we could find it she it was, was incarcerated in 1939 which was basically a year of when World War II started and the reality of that time was very different from what we enjoy these days she could have had some grounds that she was a subject of medical experiments because that was a common practice at that time it wasn't something unspeakable it wasn't something that was uh, seen as inhumane or immoral eugenics movement was a thing it was practiced among practitioners at that time and it was seen as something good and uh, respectable yeah no actually they, they got a lot of high praises for their works in those fields mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of people agreed with these views at the time which i mean obviously nowadays just forced abortions or euthanization for or sterilization for just having a mixed race relationship is it's outrageous it wouldn't be capable of occurring nowadays you know also what i wanted to add is valma had to lose her canadian citizenship because according to canadian citizenship act at that time any woman that would get married to a non-canadian would have to lose her canadian citizenship and get her husband's citizenship yeah. And she didn't know that and she only found out years later when she had to fly to Hong Kong and all of a sudden it turned out that passport was invalid and she actually had to reapply to get her Canadian citizenship. Yeah. Also the year that she was put in Bowman House, City of Hamilton stopped issuing marriage licenses between Canadians and uh, the Chinese. Mm -hmm. municipality of toronto still did it although it was still very frowned upon it wasn't the societal norm yeah to uh, just an additional note too there was an article that we wrote or we read sorry um that was regarding chinese immigrants it happened that a lot of them would have families or marriages back home but they were unable to bring their wives to canada because of these strict rules Yet it was still more beneficial for them to work in Canada because they would earn a lot more money and they'd be able to send that money back home to help out mm -hmm. their other families. That being said, though, they would still find relationships or they would find people that they were interested in in Canada. And a lot of them opted to just have common law marriages or not even go through the process of having a family. One, because of those societal norms and those restrictions that were placed on them, but also too because they felt like this was a more manageable way and it's something that they could actually accomplish I guess rather than going through the whole hardship of trying to get married and trying to start a family when it just didn't seem logical or capable at the time. When Valma got out of the prison she married her boyfriend Harib but the marriage didn't survive long because they had to endure extreme poverty and on top of that Velma's baby was born extremely sick and they had to deal with the prejudices, with the discrimination, with poverty and with the child's disability on top of that. Mm -hmm. It took a toll on their mental health and on their relationship and they weren't able to continue. Yeah. So um, that was bad and pretty detrimental uh, and another thing too also i guess just the fact that like um, chinese-run businesses were not allowed to hire white women 
in several uh, provinces. I think it was Manitoba, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, as well as uh, Ontario. Uh, all these provinces had outcast Chinese immigrants business or Chinese businesses from hiring these women because they were afraid of these mm -hmm. mixed race relationships. And then also um, they restricted where the Chinese could work as well. So for Harry, that really limited his ability to grow and become successful. He was more or less limited to being a waiter. Mm -hmm. The yeah. best thing he could do was maybe own a restaurant down the road, like Velma's father, but which a lot of Chinese immigrants did end up doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's usually the most successful were the Chinese restaurants. And maybe why you see so many still to this day. Yeah. Maybe. Just speculation. Yeah. Velma once said, I was worse than a pro. Even those at the bottom of the society viewed themselves better than anyone that associated with the Chinese. She also recalls a situation when um, she mm. was in high school and uh, there was a guy that she was into or and I guess he was into her too. They, they were some, hanging out. Yeah, they were hanging out. They were having a good time. It was either him that w was a little insecure about hanging out with her because she was half Greek or it were like his peers that tried to discourage him from hanging out with her. That happens actually. That happens a lot. I mean, it's kind of a personal story, but that actually did happen to myself too. So, yeah. Yeah, peer pressure. Yeah, dangerous, somebody, dangerous. Somebody tells you that she's freaky and you believe him and then it depends oh. on what type of freaky we're talking about. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, that was another story. I mean, there were a lot of those moments, I guess. She didn't come forward about her experiences at Belmont House and Mercer Reformatory until 63 years after that happened. And in 2002, she filed a lawsuit against the government of Ontario for $11,000. What million? 11, uh, $11 million. $11 I'm million. Sorry. Dollars. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah. But she didn't get that much. Yeah, the 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 amount that she got was undisclosed. Mm, so. Undisclosed. Must be less than that. Have you ever seen that documentary Making Murderer? No. Okay, me either. Anyways. <laughs> no, because I just remember he was uh trying to sue them for thirty six million dollars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then they turned around and accused him of murder. So there was a technicality that the female refugee act violates the Constitution of Canada by legislating a criminal law on a federal level, which the Female Refugee Act is on a provincial level. So Velma should never have been incarcerated as a prisoner. She should only have been found under provincial law as incorrigible. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the, obviously the punishment should have been much more lenient. She didn't do anything adverse or she didn't harm the society. She didn't do anything bad, right? Yeah, but uh, she was incarcerated as a prisoner, more or less, at the Andrew Mercer Reformatory, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which should never have happened. Eventually, she did receive an apology and financial compensation in an undisclosed amount, which... Uh, it's probably not 11 I million. Mean, that's just my opinion, our opinion, I suppose. But yeah, no, it probably wasn't 11 million. I doubt million it was 20 mil. I mean, maybe, maybe it was more. Maybe that's why they didn't want to tell you. No. But <laughs> I doubt it. Yeah. But there is actually a Netflix documentary that's being made. I don't know. Like I feel like it's it's been stuck. It, it it's could been be stagnant. on hold at this yeah. point. But um, maybe some of that undisclosed amount went towards that. Who knows? Just thinking. And she did pass away in 2019 mm -hmm. at the age of 98 years old. It's a good long life. Oh, it's a difficult life. Though. Well, not a good one. <laughs> Sorry. We don't get to choose one for yeah. ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> well. Unfortunately. Well, let's hope the majority of it was good. Mm-hmm. It was just those first 20-something years. Yeah. That were pretty shitty. Well, there were like 40 years that were shitty. And then, 40? Yeah, because she had to deal with her son uh, sick and then the poverty and moving him back and forth all the time. Yeah. And the divorce and everything. I wonder when it... What age she was when she remarried? Because she did remarry to a white, mm. anglicized man mm -hmm. and have two children with him. Oh. Maybe like 35, 32, 35. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was, a, there was a good 20 years in there that were pretty shitty. But let's hope the rest of them weren't that bad. Hopefully. We can't find information on that, but yeah, no. hopefully. The world has changed for the better, so. No, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And let's just hope it keeps going in that. Route. Hopefully, it's gonna stay on that route. Right. Balma had a tumultuous life, and her imprisonment was a huge part of it, but it wasn't the only part of it. Had it not been 
the dysfunctionality of uh, the society and the family that she grew up in, her life had probably had taken a different trajectory. And now we're glad that this day and age in Canada, it's, it's changed so that mostly everybody is given a fair chance at living healthy and prosperous life. Mm -hmm. That was Valma's story. Thank you for watching it. We hope you did like it. Please leave us a comment down below and uh, like us, subscribe, and we'll see you in some more of our videos. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna cover some more topics. Thank you. Hit that notification bell. Yeah. Ding.